where's my money? Andrew, are we on? Yep. You're on? Good evening. This is a public information meeting for the Gulfstown Rail Trail, August 23rd, 2012. And this information meeting is about a uh, engineering study for the Gulfstown Rail Trail. The purpose of the meeting is to present the results of the engineering study which will facilitate improvements to the Gulfstown Rail Trail. It's funded through a 2010 Transportation Enhancement Grant. And we will obtain final input this evening on a preferred alternative before proceeding to the next design phase. So the briefer for the rest of the meeting and will be Greg Bacchus, and he's with the design firm hired by the town using the uh, funds from the 2010 Transportation Enhancement Grant. Greg is from the firm Vaness Hagen and Bruslin, mm -hmm. located in Bedford. And uh, I'm very happy that he's part of this contract because Greg has had a very wide experience with uh, bicycle trails, rail trails throughout uh, not only New England but other uh, states here. So, Greg, um, take over and present to the audience the result of your engineering study. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> I want to note before we um, get into the slides that um, uh, this project has had a long history and between the advocacy groups and the town working together, uh, and including the state for that matter, um, there's been a lot of, I, at least from an outsider's perspective, there's been a lot of support, and I'm really happy to be part of that. Um, and with that history, I think the project has really been defined, and uh, we're not starting at square one. Uh, when VHB came on board, there was already a lot of work that had been done. Um, in fact, we were involved with a charrette years ago, uh, helping to define the project, but. Um, the town has been proactive along the way to, to get grant money and, and do pieces at a time of the trail. So the project we're talking about right now is not um, completing the entire trail. We're doing uh, remedies to two important locations on the trail that required uh, a higher investment level and more engineering involvement. Uh, so that's where we came in, and, and I'll get right into it. Um, <clears throat> And since there's less than 30 people in the room, feel free to uh, stop me at any time, uh, ask questions. We can keep this pretty informal. Brief agenda. I just want to talk a little bit about project background, and I guess I've already done some of that. Talk about the purpose and need statement for the project. Talk about existing conditions, just a review. Uh, discuss design criteria, proposed improvements, and estimated costs. And then at the end, uh, any additional public comment and discussion. Um, the agenda that I just laid out is actually very similar to the, uh, the chapters in the engineering report that has been submitted to New Hampshire DOT. So I'm, I'm more or less going through the, the engineering study. A little bit of background. <clears throat> um, welcome. Uh, New Hampshire like many New England states, uh, was heavily developed by railroads. And this is just a map that shows the numerous rail lines that crisscrossed the state, uh, mostly in the river valleys and across the plains. And today, though many of those rail lines are now inactive or defunct and uh, create opportunities for rail trails. I put this slide up because uh, it is becoming the state's longest rail trail, um, extending from the Methuen, Massachusetts border all the way up to Lebanon and 
potentially the Vermont border. Uh, it's being uh, named the Granite State Rail Trail at this time. And Goffstown, <clears throat> although not directly on the trail, is at a, uh, an important spur off to the west side of the trail, uh, emanating out of Manchester. In Manchester, the trail is called the Piscataquag Trail, and then, of course, in Goffstown, it's two, it's two miles. It, two miles, and then the Goffstown Trail is over five. So the point here is that we're part of something bigger, and that although this project only is looking at two spot locations on the Goffstown Trail, it really is uh, important to the entire network. And then this is a graphic showing the Goffstown Trail itself. And then the sites we're going to be looking at, <clears throat> or the sites that we are studying under our contract, site one uh, that is shown here is uh, it's our western site. It's the smaller of the two, um, it, and I'll show much more detail, but it's um, uh, over by the villa. And then <clears throat> site, site two um, is over by Henry Bridge Road, and it's a larger site. So first let me get into the purpose and need of the statement and uh, uh, need statement for the project. And what is a purpose and need statement? Um, it's really important early on to define what it is you're trying to solve. Uh, what is the purpose of the project? And then it's very important to do that because as you go through permitting and as you go through public process, um, you need to figure out how well do your solutions align with that purpose and need. So as part of the report, we had to define what the purpose and need is. So just paraphrasing, the purpose is to enhance non-motorized, primarily bike and pedestrian accommodations, address obstacles and concerns that introduce discontinuities in the overall trail, provide alternative transportation op opportunities. Uh, this, this trail, when completed, will provide a commuting route into Manchester for people. Increase opportunities for physical exercise and recreation. Improve safety at the trail's public road crossings. And really, that's the crux of the matter for this project. The need <clears throat> um, is really expressed by some of the uh, deficiencies on the trail. And um, number one is there are two at-grade trail crossings of Mass Road, Route 114. State Highway. State Highway, right. Um, there's an accurate trail crossing of Henry Bridge Road. Which is town owned. Town owned, right. And then uh, there's a gully that exists, uh, formerly a trestle, um, over old Henry Bridge Road, which is no longer in service as a town road. And then, importantly, trail use is increasing. As Manchester completes the trestle over the Piscataquag River next year, um, that is only going to lead to increased trail use. Um, and then as you are completing segments of the trail, uh, trail use will increase. So there's a great need to complete these important um, uh, discontinuities. So let's focus on site one, existing conditions. This is an aerial view that shows um, where our study area is. This is the uh, Villa Augustina ball fields right here, popular spot for recreation and and it's a really a traffic generator and also a pedestrian bike generator a lot of kids uh, would love to be able to walk and ride their bikes there um, and what is shown in the white dash is the existing railroad corridor or actually i should call it former railroad corridor uh, and then below that here is route 114 that crosses by the ball fields up here is PSNH facility. Down over here is the Shell Station, just as landmarks. Zooming in a little bit, you can see that the old railroad crossed at a tremendous skew angle to the roadway. Um, for pedestrian and bike crossings, that's considered very dangerous. So a, a real goal of the project is, is to eliminate that skewed crossing. The other thing is you can see it goes through a informal parking area for the ball fields. It goes right through the middle and then continues out you know, the east side. That's not desirable. You don't want to be mixing pedestrians and bikes with people parking cars. Uh, and then on the other side, there's a, a pullout as well. Uh, so really not a great situation. If we were to improve the trail right on its existing alignment, uh, that would not be good. 
There are some curves in Route 114. We have examined the site distances uh, to make sure that we're locating the crossing at the best location. Uh, we're expecting some feedback actually from New Hampshire DOT on that subject any day. Um, I noticed this, this picture was taken in, I think it was fall or winter, and sight lines are actually better than they are today. Today there's vegetation and it's something just coming over here tonight that I noticed that we're going to want to um, do some, uh, I guess, or have a policy of actively maintaining the roadside uh, vegetation in the area of the crossings. It can make a big difference in sight lines. This is actually looking directly up the rail trail. Um, that's that informal parking area or turnaround on the, the north side. Looking west. Looking west, yep. This is facing east from roughly the, uh, the ball field parking lot. Transformer station is, is to the to left the, of the left. picture. Right. And you can see some of the overhead wires. One thing we noted, having spent time in the field, on the ground, uh, traffic tends to, um, at peak hours, be very steady from both directions. There aren't, a, there aren't that many traffic signals uh, on this corridor in the first place, and they're not very near this location, and there aren't many breaks. You can observe people waiting a long time to cross the road, <clears throat> cross the road here. Um, and speeds, the, the road is posted at 40. Uh, we observe people are doing at least that. Um, so let's go to uh, site number two, existing conditions, before we talk about solutions. The shaded area shows the, the extent of site two, and then zooming in a little bit, um, Henry Bridge Road comes in from this side to Mast Road along here. And then again, the white dash is the existing um, trail corridor. Zooming in some more, at the western end of that section, you've got Pro Landscape right here. Uh, and you've probably observed that they've actually developed part of the trail uh, as a um, paver display area for them but it also does create a very usable piece of trail across their frontage. But you also notice that this angle, again, is very skewed, not a desirable condition at all for crossing Mass Road, and it's on a bit of a curve. That's a view. The trail would come in from the right, from the east, and then cross, and the pro landscape area is over here on the left. So the old railroad used to cross at a very skew angle, like right there. Oh, and there's their display area, pro landscape. Moving a little bit further east, uh, Henry Bridge Road comes in, and the trail would cross Henry Bridge Road at a, at a spot that is nice and level, but the road then dips down, going down Henry Bridge, and there's quite a curve uh, where sight distance is very poor uh, to that crossing. This angle, looking at, it, looking at it from the north, it shows it a little bit better. You can actually see the terrain change. You can see the, the shadowing, the, the embankment here. You're quite a bit lower. As you come up Henry Bridge Road, your view is very much obstructed by the embankment right here. Uh, you really cannot see the crossing uh, very well at all. I also want to point out that former Henry Bridge Road is over here, and that's where there used to be a trestle, so then now I'm, I'm calling it a gully or a gap um, that is another one of our discontinuities that we need to address. This arrow just points out the desirable sight line. is something like that from the driver's eye from back here to be able to recognize that there's somebody potentially in the crossing. That's just another photo from down below, uh, looking at how obstructed that crossing is. This is what's left of old Henry Bridge Road. Two different photos uh, merged together. It shows some of the relics of the old trestle, some old concrete abutments and uh, wooden supports. Um, and I'll get into solutions shortly on that. 
as part of the um, design process, we have to examine environmental and cultural resources on a project. Uh, there are federal funds involved, so there's very set procedures that we have to go through. Um, <clears throat> for this project, the environmental resources are minimal. We don't have floodplain, we don't have wetlands. Uh, we're very, uh, we're pretty much clear on environmental uh, impact. Cultural resources, um, we're also in pretty good shape. There really are no uh, railroad artifact buildings. There are no historic homes on this piece of the project. Um, the only concern that has been raised so far is there's a old stone wall that we just wanted to ver or I'm sorry, cultural resources folks wanted to verify uh, whether that was railroad related or not. And looking at old plans, there was not a railroad building there, so <clears throat> it looks more like it was there for landscaping. Um, we are, however, being required uh, to study whether the corridor as a whole is um, historically significant. Before we do any work on it with federal money, uh, we're being asked to clear that. Um, so uh, we're in discussion still with historic preservation on um, whether that study is actually um, necessary. And if we do do it, to uh, what level of, um, uh, how deep do we go? Uh, I think currently the, think, the thinking is that if we do have to do that study, it would only be focused on um, the project itself, um, although we're being asked currently to study the entire corridor. When I talk about design criteria, the type of trail that we're proposing on this segment is like the rest of the trail that you've been doing, which is a 10-foot wide granular trail. And this is a photo that shows one of the segments that you recently completed. Nice, stable, relatively smooth, granular surface. So let's talk about solutions. Back to site one, back by the ball fields. Uh, the current design uh, shows not crossing on the skew where the old railroad was, but going out and around past uh, the PSNH uh, facility and then crossing at a 90 degree angle away from the parking lot um, and then con connecting up to the, uh, the existing trail on the east side. The parking lot itself would be separated. There is a driveway shown here. Uh, we would put in a buffer that includes some grass <clears throat> and a fence so that the trail user is very clear on where they're supposed to be and that they're not supposed to come in the driveway and the people using the uh, parking lot are also clear that they're not supposed to drive on the trail. Um, so we'll be using things like fencing and landscaping in this area on both sides actually to define where the trail is. We don't want people crossing the road wantonly. We want them to uh, cross at the designated location. Um, we are proposing a little trailhead parking over where this turnaround is here today. There'd be a gravel lot that would be just formalized a little bit. Uh, I think there's some value in that. Uh, but there, again, the trail would be fenced off uh, so people aren't encouraged to cross um, the road at that location. This is just a graphic that approximates where the trail would go along the PSNH property, avoiding their utility poles and guy, wi guy wires. And then let's talk about the crossings themselves. Um, in discussions with the New Hampshire DOT Traffic Bureau, uh, it was determined that fully actuated um, red, yellow, green uh, stoplights are not warranted at this location. And um, the next step down from that is to put some type of alert system that at least warns motorists that um, there may be somebody crossing. So the, the current proposal is uh, what are called rapid flashing pedestrian crossing beacons. And this photo illustrates what they look like during the daytime. <clears throat> My arrow is pointing towards one of them and is actually flashing right there. It's hard to see. But uh, the one on the right, the photo on the right, shows what they look like at night. So the idea is that a pedestrian comes along, or a bicyclist, and they stop and they push a button. The flasher goes off. And what that does is it only alerts the motorist uh, that there's somebody there. 
It does not stop traffic. Um, we are not going to be allowed to paint a crosswalk, currently anyway. Um, DOT is not allowing us to paint a crosswalk on the state highway, partly because it's state highway and partly because it's 40 miles an hour through here. And uh, so the safety improvement that we are providing is really to heighten the awareness of the motorist, that there's a pedestrian who wants to cross. It's still up to the motorist whether they stop or not. Without a crosswalk, they're not required to. Um, if there's a pedestrian in the road when they get there, they have to stop, obviously. Uh, you cannot just, you know, you have to stop if there's a person in the road. And what the flashing beacon will do in that case is, it, again, it draws their attention. It makes them look up and say, oh, what's that? And I've seen them in the daytime, and they do flash pretty brightly. It's, a, it's an LED strobe effect. They alternate left and right. Um, I've so been told, Greg, that, that they're similar to uh, the flashing lights on the top of a police cruiser. Okay, yep, yep. So they do catch your eye. <laughs> and um, they don't flash all the time. So uh, that's another good thing. If they were flashing all the time, if it was just like a yellow beacon flashing, motorists become complacent. It doesn't catch their eye. So when the motorists, and, and you have a lot of commuters here that, ride, that drive this every day, so their expectation is that, okay, if it is flashing, then I better really be on my toes because there might be a pedestrian there. So that's the theory behind it. Um, there's a few different technologies. Uh, we were just having a discussion earlier that you can either have a push button type or you can have it where it detects the pedestrian or bicyclist as they come along and they don't have to push a button, it automatically flashes. And there's pros and cons to both. Um, the, the pro we think of having a push button is next to the push button you have a little sign and this is actually an example of the sign, or one of the signs you could put there. It says, push button to turn on warning lights. And that gets across a message that it's only a warning light. Uh, there's some other signs you can put, that, that put there that say, um, vehicles may, may not stop. Um, you can have signs like that. Or uh, in addition to, you're going to have stop signs on the trail itself. We don't want pedestrians or bikes just going out. They have to stop no matter what. So uh, we're going to try to do whatever is allowed under the, um, the guidelines to make this a safe crossing. And, and Greg, at, at all of the uh, public crossings already, there are stop signs presented to the bicyclists. Yes, right. And so same, it'll be consistent. Yep. Same situation here. Mm -hmm. Yep. And um, the town has purchased um, bollards, steel bollards, that would be placed wherever there are road crossings in the center of the trail. And, and those serve a few purposes. One is to prevent motorists, motor vehicles, from coming in the trail. Um, and then the other one is it is, uh, as we talked about the other day, it's another signal to the, mo to the bicyclists as they come upon a crossing that they can see that bollard probably long before they see the pavement. So it, it kind of alerts them. Be five, five inches diameter, right? Yeah, painted yellow. Yellow, right. <laughs> Reflective tape. Uh, one on the left, one on the right, and one, one in, in the, the center. Middle. Yep. The one in the center will be uh, removable, Removal. right? Mm -hmm. So uh, maintenance and emergency vehicles can access the trail. So that helps define uh, the crossing to the pedestrian and the bicyclist. And the fact that you're going to have them at all the road crossings, again, is predictable and uniform for the for the user of the trail. This is a photograph of an installation. It's a new installation on Route 101 in Marble, New Hampshire. And it's exactly what we've been talking about. It's the rapid flashing beacon pedestrian crossing sign. There it's 25 mile an hour speed limit, however, and they were allowed to put a crosswalk even though it's worn off. Now, advancing, advancing the project, we have to weigh alternatives. We have to keep an open mind to alternatives to solutions. And one thought that was kicked around, I guess, early, even before we were involved, was um, could you put refuge islands in the middle of Route 114 so that uh, bikes and peds only have to cross one lane at a time and, and have a little, a little bit of safety in the middle? <clears throat> and the 
the feeling was early on that because of the nature of the road, because it's State Route 114, because it's 40 miles an hour, uh, it would never be allowed by New Hampshire DOT, and we believe that is the case, and um, uh, would just not be a compatible use uh, for them. Uh, so uh, that, is, that has been dropped as an alternative. Um, so Site 2 Solutions. Back at Pro Landscape, the, our project actually begins uh, at the limit of their improved area. And instead of going across at askew, again, we want to follow Route 114 and then cross it a 90 degree angle and then get back onto the trail with the rapid flashing beacons. Out at the east end of Site 2, um, let me bring in. To improve the sight distance on Henry Bridge Road, we're proposing to do significant grading along that corner to, to lower the embankment so that you will be able to see um, up the hill towards the crossing well in advance. We will also add um, the flashing beacons and because Henry Bridge Road is not a state route and it is not 40 miles an hour, we will paint crosswalks uh, at that crossing. This just shows the type of grading we're talking about here. To take down that little knoll that prevents you from seeing around the corner. We also intend to fill the gully at Old Henry Bridge Road. And Dave, actually the, the town had done a uh, analysis on different bridge types that could potentially span that. And the solution that we're proposing is not a bridge at all, but um, earthwork. We're planning to fill in that gully and actually lower the trail. This is an exaggerated profile, but it gives you an idea, idea of what's planned. The crosshatch area up here and over here is actually cutting the trail. And then the material that is cut would be used to help fill in the gully. And the material that is being cut over at the Henry Bridge, uh, Henry Bridge Road um, slope that I showed you in the earlier slides would be trucked down here to help fill that, that gully. And we actually believe and have calculated that there would be pretty much a material balance between cuts and fills. So we don't have to go out and purchase a bunch of gravel and, and fill material. And since they're very close to each other, we felt it would be a very economical uh, solution to fill that in. Um, and the reason we discounted the bridge um, was primarily initial cost, but also the concern that maintaining a bridge over time is something that the town probably would not like to do, is um, you try not to have bridges if you don't need them. Um, so the bridge fell out as a undesirable Alternative. Greg, yep. uh, you, uh, just to point out on that diagram the exaggeration of the, the vertical slope. Yep. Uh, at the low point, it appears to be three feet lower right. than a straight through level crossing. Yep. And the approach grades? And its approach is about 200 feet. Anyways, the significance is that the slope is uh, within the limits for handicapped accessible yes. pathways. Right. Uh, we're, we're designing it at a three and a half percent profile slope, which is really uh, not steep at all. And uh, where it's a gravel trail, we did not want to get any steeper than that for erosion purposes and also uh, people on bikes going downhill on gravel. There's an engineering reason also if the slope was uh, filled in to be level completely through the gully, the fill would... Uh, encroach upon the four abutters of the property more than it, you actually show there. Right. We have relatively minor slope impacts under the current design, and Dave is right. If we, if we filled it up so it was a straight profile, those impacts would increase. The amount of fill would increase. I should note, too, that um, we're planning to install a drainage pipe uh, because otherwise water would be trapped on the mast road side of the, the gully. Um, and we're proposing a uh, metal sleeve for future water line uh, relocations or repairs if they are ever needed, since there is a water line 
currently in the former Henry Bridge Road, and we're going to put about 16 feet of fill over it. If there was ever a problem with that pipe, um, it would be really difficult to excavate 16 feet of fill to get to it. So we're putting in a new sleeve that if they ever need it, the sleeve would be there to, uh, to switch over uh, the water line. This is just a, a close-up of that profile. <clears throat> and then a close-up of the plan view. The yellow is the trail itself. The green uh, is grass slope work. Uh, the little red lines are slope easements or construction easements, actually, uh, to be able to do the work on three of the parcels. The fourth is part of the right-of-way. And then finally, costs, our preliminary estimate uh, for both sites combined is at about $270,000. As we get through final design, we'll refine those costs, uh, and hopefully we get out to bid. While we still have a good uh, bidding environment, uh, prices have been coming in really good on projects these days, So, and there's no paving involved on this project. It's, it's all just really earthwork, so we anticipate that these these prices are probably good, if not conservative. Uh, they do not include right-of-way acquisition costs. We do anticipate some expenditure on right-of-way, for, especially for the parcel across PSNH, uh, their frontage. Uh, and this does not include um, construction inspection costs. And uh, Before we go into uh, public comment, Greg, uh, what is the the next step in the uh, for the construction yep coming out of an engineering study right tell the viewers mm -hmm. what's going to happen over the next year right the um well we haven't received comments yet from dot on the uh, engineering study we're anticipating that they ought to be uh, fairly minor um, once the study is accepted um, we still need to complete the cultural resources study and uh, finish our environmental process. Uh, we're, we're hoping that takes less than two months. Um, and then we're able to launch into final design, which on a project like this is really not that involved. Uh, but what we do is we produce construction drawings, uh, construction specifications, and then a bid package, which we would put out um, to advertise to contractors to bid on. Um, so that all said, um, we're, we're planning a spring construction uh, for this project, uh, spring into summer. It would be a relatively um, short-term construction. Luckily, it's off-roadway. Most of it is off-roadway. Um, it should be relatively uh, quick, I'd say two months at most, uh, construction phase. So hopefully at this time next year, everything's absolutely buttoned up and complete. Which would also dub tail very nicely into uh, Manchester having completed the bridge over the Piscataquag River right. next spring, next mm -hmm. summer. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. And yep. uh, as you mentioned, uh, trail users from Manchester and regional sites. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Using yep. their trail and coming into Gulfstown. Yep. So um, we welcome your comments and questions, if you have before we, oh, yeah. uh, before we ask people to come to the table and uh, for public comment, uh, there's also opportunities for viewers to uh, mail or fax or email additional comments besides those you hear this evening. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll provide the uh, information to you. Uh, if you want to email Greg, it's... Uh, G. Bacchus B. It's uh, excuse me, G. B. A. K. O. S. At V. H. B. That's Victor Hotel Bravo. Dot com. And the fax number would be uh, six four four twenty three eighty five. And uh, so we've covered the email and the fax number. If you want to mail a comment in, it would be uh, VHB Incorporated, 6 Bedford Farms Drive, Suite 607, Bedford, New Hampshire, and the zip is 03110. 
Greg will receive comments up until September 5th, at which time he's got to finalize the comments and proceed forward. Mm -hmm. With the next finalize the report, our, right? Our report. Yep. Okay. Would any uh, members of the audience want to come up to our table here where the microphones are and uh, uh, make any comment? Yes, you can come up, please. No, any any one of these microphones, and just identify who you are and uh, make your public comment, please. I just have a statement to read. Good evening. And you are? My name is Ruth Pierce, and I'm the current president of the Gosstown Historical Society. A community's historical society seeks to preserve early town history and preserve features which promote an understanding of that history. I'm here to promote the construction of Gosstown Rail Trail without distracting or slowing down progress due to concerns about historic preservation. Granted, I have not checked with my executive board or with our past or current pre uh, curators, but as far as I know, the Gosstown Historical Society sees no need to pursue any effort to have the rail line corridor leading into or through Gosstown or any particular physical feature within the rail corridor identified for recognition as an as an historic place. The town has been promoting the use of the rail line corridor as an alternative transportation corridor, i.e. bicycle path for commuters, as well as recreational enjoyment for residents and regional visitors since 1997 with inclusion in a master plan. In the years following, town voters approved funds for the property purchase 2001 Residents, regional officials, and professional design consultants participated in a design charrette 2004, and many town hearings have been conducted by the Board of Selectmen to accept various grant funds for trail construction. In none of these situations, as far as I know, did residents or officials suggest or promote the need to advocate any historic preservation actions. A significant step in the completion of the Goffstown Rail Trail will be the safe passage of the rail trail through the former Henry Road and across three busy highways. Such a project is very expensive, and Goffstown residents and officials are very pleased to have received a generous federal grant to do this project. However, any requirement to use a portion of the federal grant money to conduct an historic place study is unnecessary and so would be a waste of a portion of the grant money. Thank you for this opportunity to promote the development of the Goffstown Rail Trail. Ruth, thank, thank you, you for You're welcome. <laughs> thank you for those comments from the Goffstown Historic Society. Lo, want to come All right, so I'm Lowell Von Ruden, president of the Friends of the Goffstown Rail Trail and also a frequent trail user. Um, Greg, would you mind going back to the, your s overview slide of Site 1 where you showed the uh, proposed um, routes? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing that occurred to me as you were speaking about this one is uh, – in the proposed new alignment there where it's um, you know a nice perpendicular cross it and which which is a very good improvement there um, one thought occurred to me with the uh, position of that um, entry exit into the informal parking yeah uh, any vehicles that are westbound on 114 at that point and decide they want to stop and turn left are pretty much going to be parked directly on the trail crossing. Uh. Um, I don't know if maybe that entry point could be shifted around somehow so mm -hmm. it would allow a little bit more of a buffer there. Mm -hmm. 
I, I also you know, really like the uh, the idea of adding some parking there on the west side of the road and oh, good. and then the detail it was shown on this uh, yeah it's on the other one. Oh yeah that one on the diagram on the wall there you know, I think is a very nice arrangement for that good. Um, and, and that'll be an important place to have it too not just for trail users but I'm sure that all the numerous vehicles that parked to use the ball fields there will also be using that. Yep, and hopefully they use the trail to cross. Hopefully. That's the, that's, <laughs> that's the goal, and yes. we'll encourage that. Um, I will note that one, uh, one change to that parking lot, uh, New Hampshire DOT has already commented that they would like to see it be one drive instead of two. Instead of being circulating, they would rather have just a single entry and exit, which may reduce its uh, parking capacity, but we'll, we'll did, redesign. Did, did they offer any reason as to why they prefer that? They always like to reduce the number of driveways, uh, number of conflict points. Is oh, their, okay. Is their so reasoning, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and, you know, I can understand that, although, you know, I certainly think that the, your, your current layout, you know, gives a much better flow yeah. um, mm -hmm. and makes it easier for people to get in and out. Right, yeah. We we're hoping to make it one way, although where it's not paved, it's kind of hard to stripe it that way. Uh, yeah, but that's true. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, you know, now, you know, with this kind of crossing too, you know, just to you know, talk a little bit about the uh, the markings. Um, yep. You know, the you know, flashing beacons. I think are. A very good solution for this location. I've seen them in use in other other locations. Um, however, not having any kind of marking on the road, I think, is a completely ridiculous approach. Um, and I understand that's not your preference, right. but you know, I think you know the, the DOT is you know completely wrong on this. You know, you need to have some kind of an better indication to the trail users as to where they're supposed to be and for the motor vehicles to know where to expect the trail users. Um, mm -hmm. Do you know offhand like what the typical distance would be from the you know designated crossing area or to you know the post that has the beacons? Is it is it, it pretty much right? Th it's pretty there? much right there. Okay, and so it has a, there, there isn't any like advanced distance no, or anything. It's got a downward pointing arrow, okay. basically saying they're right here. Yeah, yeah. That I suppose helps define the crossing because they're on both sides. The signs have reflective signs on both sides of each post. Um, so. Oh, okay, okay. I, I didn't realize it's on both sides. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the beacons are on both sides of the post then also? You know, I'm not sure about that. Let me check the... <laughs> yeah, they, they are. Yeah. The one on the left, yep. the one on the island has. Them. Yes, okay. definitely on both yeah. sides. Yeah, look, yeah, okay, it does look like that that's the case. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, I also, since you've got the, the photo there, uh, I note the, the solar panel there. Um, Yep. Do you have any knowledge as to uh, how often you might have a situation where you run out of power, power the beacons? Don't know that. Um, the one, the one here in um, Marlboro on Route 101 is also solar powered, so I suppose we could see how they do over the winter. Uh, that would be presumably the worst yeah, month. Yeah, I wonder if anybody's got any data. We, on that out, the uh, town does have one solar power driven uh, flashing red light. Oh, that one on Wallace Road? Wallace Road. Yeah. And we have a complication in that the trees hide the winter sun, and so the batteries run dry, run mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. in the winter. Okay. And so in this image you see now, is uh, they're pretty well exposed to the even winter sunlight. Yeah, I think that would be the case along the rail trail um, too. In your design, I would, you know, you're gonna have to evaluate whether it's solar power and uh, reliable solar power, right. or, or it's gonna have to be fed by electricity. Right, I think um, my understanding is there is power available at these locations if we choose to use it. Um, it, it usually involves 
cutting Route 114 to get a conduit across, right. which we're probably trying to avoid. Oh, oh right. It's def definitely desirable to avoid that. Yeah. But um, that's what, but, what I was just It's a great question. Curious. I think one good thing is in the winter, you probably have less people pushing the button, too. It's probably flashing less frequently. Oh, that's a good point. I didn't think of that. You don't have as many users. And uh, I already know that whatever facility is installed for a crossing at these locations on the state highway, the, the state highway would, the uh, DOT would require the town to sign an agreement that uh, the town would be responsible for the long-term maintenance of whatever the, that crossing facility is. Yeah. So it's, it's not a state responsibility. It would be a, a town responsibility for maintenance. Yeah, and uh, I would kind of expect that. Lowell, um, if a crosswalk were to be put down, um, that's allowed if the speed limit is 30 miles an hour, um, not 40. Well, I wonder who's, who's setting that regulation because the other location where I saw this, the posted speed was either 40 or 45 miles an hour. And it was a U.S. federal highway f four lanes wide. Four lanes, right. Mm -hmm. okay. so and they didn't seem to have any problem. You know, they, they, in fact, they, they didn't post the speed any lower there, but they did install this kind of a, you know, a crossing so system. There's an opportunity to look at the federal highway design manuals and yeah. see what is allowed. And yeah, because I, I'd, I'd wonder if, if is that 30 mile an hour restriction um, something that really exist in in law somewhere or is that just um, somebody's preference in DOT right I'll, I'll look into that it may be state law it's possible it's possible it, yeah or it may be just DOT policy yeah it, it could be either one and, and I would think that, that if it was just policy that that'd probably be um, more of a chance that you can get that changed um, yeah so if you could then Flip over to your, your site two overview. Um, Should I go further? Um, let's see. You had a closer one, didn't you? Yeah, I guess my same comment on, on that crossing would be pretty much the same. Yeah, so if you could go over to like either the, the fill or the, you know. Um, okay, so you were talking about the uh, the fill on at the old Henry Bridge Road there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I certainly appreciate the, uh, you, you know, like the greatly reduced cost and maintenance kind of burden there uh, um, and good thinking about putting the sleeve through there. Um, I am a little bit disappointed in that you are blocking off um, access along that road because I do see people walking through there. Mm. Um, so I don't know if there's, if it's, would be at all possible for them to even climb this new embankment? I don't. I don't know what kind of what kind of slope is there on that. It would be difficult. Pretty steep. It would be two to one. Yeah, and uh, there is there is today a little goat path that is formed along here that you can see people right have gone up that side. Um, yeah, mainly on motorized vehicles. Is that right? Yes. yes. <laughs> that wasn't worn by, by foot feet. traffic. Okay. It's erosion caused by uh, motorized vehicles, which are not allowed on the trail. I don't know. Maybe that's something that could could be turned into some kind of an access. A walking. Yeah. Uh, type I don't know. That's yeah. you know. It's. I, I think that's on private land or, or is that part of what you would be getting in the former for there by the uh an article on the march ballot march of 2012 that parcel which is the former henry bridge road is now a um a trail right not a highway right of way so it's a uh, vehicles are prohibited from using it and it's simply a, a trail a trail that's blocked. A trail that's blocked. Yes. <laughs> hmm. You know, it, you know, I recognize it would be an additional expense, but it would be, you know, nice if you could have some kind of a passage Over. under there. Yeah. Hmm. What What is the uh, the the width of at like the base of the fill there, d approximately? Do you know? From like here to here. Right. It's 
Get to be about 80 feet. Oh, oh that's OK. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Yeah, I guess that would be pretty long, wouldn't it? Yeah, how wide is the right of way? It's almost the same width as. Yeah, is, is that like one of the 99 foot <coughs> sections? I think, I think, um, I think Lowell was. It's just shy of 50 feet. I think Lowell was, you just measured this way. I think Lowell was looking at how long would a culvert be? Is that right? What, right. Yeah. The culvert? Yeah. Yeah. So if that was a 10 foot culvert for, for pedestrians. 60, 80, 90. 90. Yeah. So that'd probably be pretty expensive. That's a, yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't know if there would be any potential way to, you know, rather than a culvert, yeah, provide some kind of a, a an up and over or just up onto the trail for, right. for, for like somebody coming up from Henry Bridge Road below or something. Even like um, railroad tie stairs or something. Yeah, like yeah. Mm. Okay. That's so a good comment. If you go back to the, the overview again that area yeah that's good um, okay so going back to I, I remember one other thing oh no just leave, leave that image there um, but oh, oh, like up above where it says Phil Gully where the crossing of the road is there yeah right right there or oh, right here yeah 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 that mass road crossing um, now you know I, understanding you know dot's you know statement about you know it needing to be 30 miles an hour um to put a crosswalk there well what's that distance to henry bridge road you know people shouldn't be going you, you wouldn't expect them to be going more than that anyway so it would mm. approaching the stoplight right there's there is a distance a, a stoplight has to be 30 miles an hour at a, some distance before a stop. Yeah, so yeah. so in this particular location, it's certainly mm. a lot lower impact. Mm. To lower it. Right. So, yeah. so the traffic is brought down to 30 miles an hour yeah. ahead of the stoplight. And, and, and even if they're coming in westbound, if they're coming from the stoplight, you know, you'd expect them to be going slower at that point because they wouldn't have gotten all the way up to the speed or not, or they wouldn't have been for very long. Plus, you've got the congestion of you know the driveways from the Irving Station and true, right? Congest things like that do slow people down. Right, right? there's a lot of conflict. And, and being residential along there, maybe that should be 30 anyway. I guess DOT would say, well, do a speed study and see what people are actually driving it. That's that's how they always base their down posting right and, and and i'm sure you know like further west it is going to be higher oh definitely yeah but but here it i may. drive this twice a day right. going to work every day so i'm very familiar with it we may take uh greg you may be able to take advantage of the fact the town has requested the state do an analysis of that intersection henry bridge road and 114 mm. to determine if it would be practical to put a left-hand turn arrow at the stoplight uh, for and in the course you know, if one was going oh, uh, oh, for the, left for the existing going, left, turn, uh, right? left in this drawing mm -hmm. um, in order to make a left-hand turn on Henry Bridge Road it's difficult when there's a, a constant line of traffic coming at you oh yeah so the town has requested DOT to consider putting a left-hand turn arrow there. I'm glad to hear that. As part, as part of that, they would have to do traffic studies uh, on the volume of traffic. So you yeah, because, be able to because I know when I'm coming home in the evening and heading, you know, westbound there, you know, if you stop at that light and then somebody's eastbound in the left turn lane, right. invariably tries to, you know, jump out and beat everybody. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. So actually that... That reminds me of um, one other comment on, on site one. Sorry, I didn't think about this earlier. <laughs> nope, we can't go back to that. Okay, now talking about the speed he here also, mm -hmm. um, 
Yes, this is a more open area. Mm -hmm. People do go faster. Yeah. Um, however, just a little bit west of here, there's a school zone. So doing school hours, that's already knocked down to 30 miles an hour. And just beyond that is the urban compact line where it goes down to 30 miles an hour permanently. So again, here, this is, you know, in my experience, you know, people do drive faster here, but again, it's not very far from a lower speed marked area. Mm -hmm. I believe the flashing light for the school zone speed reduction is in the lower corner of this image. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. It's it's right there next to at, the ball field. Approaching the school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. So it almost seems legitimate to just move that a little further east. Right. Mm -hmm. But that's, uh, you know, so traffic is at a reduced speed when school is letting out. Right. Or, or they, they should be <laughs> because <laughs> the light is flashing. <laughs> Although, as we all know, some people don't pay t too close attention to those things. Yeah. Good question. Okay, so I, I think that's my comments. Oh, I'm glad you came, Mo. Uh, let's see, Greg. Um, I've got a comment now. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> yeah. And if, um, leave this image up. And once again, I'm David Pierce, I'm, uh, chair of the Gulfstown Rail Trail Development Committee and we make recommendations for the selectmen to consider, and I am also a selectman. In this image, uh, you mentioned uh, the possibility of putting parking uh, facilities on the left-hand side of that crossing, Mass Road. And uh, Andrew in our television studio has your image on the wall already set up. So Andrew, if you would uh, focus in on that one and tell me when you're there okay so he can see basically a, a two-foot image on that piece of paper so Great. Greg if you would talk just talk to it that's what the viewers are seeing now okay you, uh, specifically the parking area yes okay yeah the the image shows um, formalization of what is today a um, just a roughed out gravel turnaround slash parking area and what's currently shown in the image is um, uh, an area that's more defined with set parking spaces, an entrance and an exit. Um, and it's kind of an odd shape because we are also avoiding uh, some utility poles that are in the way um, and uh, would be very difficult to move. Um, otherwise, it would be a much more you know, standard parking lot layout. But we get a fair number of spaces in uh, to that to that little spot uh, at a great location and there's a connection a direct connection to the trail uh, so people can uh, park there and go either direction on the trail or uh, on their bikes or they can as we talked about earlier park there walk east on the trail to the safe crossing and go to the ball fields so it can serve both functions and uh, I'll point out that two of those spaces have are designed for handicapped uh, vehicle parking mm -hmm. Uh, because the trail is a, we do advocate handicapped access to the trail when it's fully built. Thank you, Greg. Yep, anytime. Thank you, Andrew. You can go back to one of our other camera shots. Uh, any other public comment? Uh, please identify yourself. Yep. My name is Warren Denby, and I'm a um, daily user of the trail in the summer on a bicycle, but also a snowshoe hmm. user in the winter. And although I have no um, comments with regard to the uh, crossings in the summer, in the winter, I am hoping that there will be sufficient concern about leaving space for snow build-up. Uh, the snow banks that we're accustomed to in the, uh, after a snowstorm um, lead me to believe there may be a problem with 
uh, people on skis or on snowshoes sliding down the snowbanks out onto the highway uh, during a uh, snowstorm. Mm. And I just want to express that concern uh, for winter users. So, and uh, I can just think out of the box here, if you're, ha Greg, if you're designing uh, fencing or landscaping along the left and right of the trail as mm -hmm. it's approaching the crossing site, that, that fencing would have to be somewhat back from the pavement so that after there's an accumulation of a snowbank with plowing, um, a plow could then scoop out the embankment mm -hmm. and not damage the fence line. Yeah. Uh, and that would allow cross-country skiers mm -hmm. and snowshoers to not climb an embankment at the expense of a little bit extra labor of time with a town snowplow. Correct, yeah. yeah. But uh, thank you for bringing it up. Yeah, wouldn't Warren. have thought of that, yeah. Um, we would be we would need to stay back from the edge of the road a little bit with everything anyway just for clear zone and for plowing and that yeah. sort of thing but um yeah that's a good concern have large snowstorms as well bring out yeah um a lot of uh skiers on the trail mm, that's good to hear as as the logo you're wearing <laughs> tonight uh we do advocate uh, winter activity on the trail yeah and no, no snowmobiles, is that correct? And no, no snowmobiles. It's strictly uh, human power. Mm -hmm. That's my only comment. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thank you. you know, Warren's comment actually reminded me of a... Come on, please. ...of a, another question. Um, you know, when he was talking about the, uh, the approach to the actual crossing, um, are you expecting here, I, I've seen in, in other... Um, gravel trails as they cross paved roads as they usually still do pave like some short kind of a, a buffer we strip. do right. would you expect to be doing that here we are intending to do paved aprons that extend uh, a little bit into the trail yes mm -hmm. yeah about how far would you uh, I forget what we drew that to be but I think we were talking 15 20 feet um, generally um, it does a few things it it, it very uh, visually defines the trail. Uh, it gives you a good durable stopping surface if you're coming along the trail. Um, it allows you to put striping, you know, the stop line. It allows you to put a bollard, uh, that kind of thing. And I think um, we really... I'll, I'll extrapolate on that. The, the pavement probably should extend far enough so if a, ve a maintenance vehicle wants to um, go on to the trail, right. the maintenance vehicle has to get off the right of way and pull onto the trail and it has to have enough space to get off the public way. Mm -hmm. Then get out of the truck, open the bollards. So, uh, so it probably needs to be a little more than even the 15, so, 20 uh, feet then. Yeah, at least 20. One design feature is to bring the, the asphalt uh, just beyond the bollards. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that would be a good approach probably a little bit easier maintenance wise and, and like you said Greg I hadn't thought about that it gives you a surface to put you know some striping right. on mm -hmm. for trail users approaching the road mm -hmm. stop yeah. line yeah. yeah stop line yeah and yeah and 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 often you'll see you know like these little chevron. triangular chevron yeah. shapes you know as you approach the bollards too yes. to, to make those stand I think that would be an excellent idea to, idea to include that as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Come on, you must have more, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Design, oh, I <laughs> design <laughs> comments. I should get my mouth shut. <laughs> yeah, th this isn't um, really specific to your design here, but um, one, one of you two had, had mentioned about the, the bollards, you know, being mm -hmm. yellow, mm -hmm. which um, you know, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that because Manchester has made a serious mistake Black in that they have black bollards and even though they have they added some reflective tape yes. it's bad still mm -hmm. they should replace those things mm -hmm. and and I also wanted to you know I think Dave you had mentioned this specifically the standard configuration would be three bollards you know one in the middle and and then one on either side 
you know, good trail design, you know, dictates that those should always be an odd number like that. So you don't have this, you know, no man's land in the middle. So right. just in case anybody ever thought about doing that, I've seen that done oh. in a couple of places and it's not nice. No. <laughs> Clearly defined left and right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Let's see if I can make up anything else since you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Oh, the, uh, in that, that proposed, you know, parking area on the west side of the road there, I, if I recall correctly, that little grassy area that's in between the, the, the two entry points, I think that's one of the locations where there is a utility pole, right? Yeah, that's why that's the, correct. there's a grass island there. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Is, is there some other pole? Well, from that, that telephone or? pole that's on the grass island, there will be an overhead uh, guide wire. Guide wire. Yeah. Oh, okay. Going back to another pole. Right okay. there. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. I think I takes care of me. Unless you Good job. Make me, <laughs> remind me of something else. Thank you for your uh, design <laughs> comments, Lowell. Um, well, we've... Uh, Members of the public here that uh, have provided comment uh, to uh, Greg, uh, he's now be considering all of these comments and making a report back to DOT. DOT, yeah. mm -hmm. results of your engineering study and public comment. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much so, and, for attending. Um, yeah. Thank you for the persons attending the uh, public information session tonight. And uh, once again, Greg Bacchus. And uh, if you want to uh, email comments to him because he's responsible for turning those comments into the study, uh, his email address is his name, G. Bacchus, that's uh, G-B-A-K-O-S at vhb.com. So uh, that'll be the uh, conclusion of our show, uh, and thank you for uh, participating in our information session this evening. Andrew, you may 